Hello and welcome back to Chillers and Thrillers. I am your host, M, and in this podcast, I read true stories of people's encounters with the strange and unexplained. No comedy, gore, or true crime. Only 100% true spooky tales. Have you ever met someone and they just seemed different? Something about their energy or being made you feel strange or uncomfortable. Some people call this their gut feeling. Others say it's instinct. And some scientists say it's a remainder of our caveman brain, a subconscious warning bell that protected us from predators thousands of years ago. Or have you ever met someone whose presence just brought a peaceful energy and warmth to you? But what is it about these people that makes our senses prickle? There are different theories, but some people speculate that these people are inhuman, either angels, demons, aliens, interdimensional visitors, or maybe even vampires. In tonight's episode, I will be reading people's true encounters with beings that were disguised as humans. So, turn down the lights, get comfortable, and let's get started. The Vampire, submitted by user PrettyBird78. I was a dancer for 13 years and used to travel around Western Canada. I was working in a town called Williams Lake with a friend. I was on stage Monday afternoon doing my first show when I noticed a guy sitting in the booth back a little from the stage. I don't think I will do this description justice, but he was gorgeous. I mean, Botticelli Angel, move over Brad Pitt, gorgeous. Blonde curls and intense blue eyes. In my entire dancing career, I was always in a long-term relationship and never stepped outside of it. I was never even tempted, but this man was everything I found tempting in one package. He threw some money on the stage and I gave him a poster. After my first show, I went over to sign it. Because it was a booth, I slipped him beside him and started signing the poster when he looked at me intensely and said, what do you think of me? I turned to face him fully and it was like my veins were suddenly full of ice water. I could almost feel an instant cord develop between us and all my energy being pulled through it. The worst though, was being this close, I was able to take a look deep into his blue eyes and there was nothing there. I mean, nothing, no soul. They were empty and terrifying. I remember I stuttered in fear when I answered him. Honestly, you terrify me. You're cold and I'm looking to your eyes and I don't see a soul. I'm not even sure you're a human being. He was looking at me with those terribly empty eyes when he said, I'm trying to learn to be human. That actually is when it gets worse. As soon as he said that, I was thrust into a vision, as in I was no longer seeing the bar or him. Instead, I was looking down at what appeared to be my hands, except they were strong, square hands that belonged to a man. And those hands were choking the life out of somebody, out of people, while I looked into their eyes. The faces kept changing under the hands, and I can still remember some of them to this day. There, the vision ended, and I was still sitting at the booth with this man, and he was staring at me so intensely that I'm certain he knew what I had seen. I mumbled out, I can't help you with that, in response to his earlier comment about trying to learn to be human, and got up shakily from the table. My friend came over and asked if I was okay, because I must have been white as a sheet. I muttered I was okay but shaken, and she commented that he really spooked her, and she had only spoken to him briefly, but he scared her. We were there working for the week. He came in Tuesday and Wednesday, but never spoke to either of us again and just sat and stared. I can't say for sure what this man was, only that he was most definitely not human. In my years, I have sadly met some of the worst people in society. These people are evil and twisted, but even so, when you looked into their eyes, there was a spark of something that showed they were human. Whatever we encountered in Williams Lake was missing this.
E-T, submitted by M underscore H underscore T underscore H. I lived in San Francisco for a while in the mid-90s. I was walking down Ashbury Street towards the Panhandle, which is a public park, in the mid-evening of a weeknight with a friend from out of town. There was no other foot traffic on the block. Coming up the hill was one of the ubiquitous homeless of that era. We called them dirt surfers. A middle age or later, woman wearing a hoodie. She was short and wearing gloves and long pants. It was March and the hay gets cold at night and damp. And sort of shuffling up the hill towards us. My buddy and I were animatedly discussing whatever and sort of eased around her to either side since she was plodding straight ahead of us. As we went past her, our convo stopped in mid-sentence, and we ambled along for maybe ten seconds in a sudden weird silence until we both stopped walking. I remember my head was suddenly kind of hazy, although we were sober, and I had to make an effort to do something besides just stand there stupidly. I looked at my friend and he seemed off too. We stared at each other a second. He said, Did you? At the same time I said, Was that? And we turned around to stare up the hill at the woman we'd passed. Because it had just occurred to me, you know how you rewind a moment in memory and look at it again? Upon review, that woman was sort of a classic gray alien, done up in human homeless garb. But the big wrapper and glasses she was wearing were actually her eyes. And she wore gloves to cover her non-human hands. She had sort of fuzzed my sight and made herself look like a homeless person as she walked by instead of an alien wearing homeless human person drag. We both stared back up the hill where she was about to turn the corner and head north on Haight Street. She stopped and stared at us, frowning her face mostly covered by the hoodie. I turned speechless to stare at my buddy. He was staring at me, mouth open. We did that four-second pointing-your-finger double-take thing, confused, then turned to look at her again, but she had moved on. We stayed on that spot for a bit longer, trying to fit what had just happened into some sort of framework, and failing. We eventually turned back downhill and just carried on towards the brew pub we were heading to. We never really discussed it again, and I had actually forgotten about the whole thing for years until I remembered it in conversation with someone. Glowing Eyes, submitted by user Notoriously Geeky. I am a lifelong, since birth, New Orleans native. I still live here. With that being said, I've seen a lot of strange people. I worked a couple of years as a bartender on Bourbon Street and would meet all kinds of characters, some scary, some not. Well, I'd say about 15 years ago now, I was dating a guy who played saxophone in a brass band on Frenchman Street. If you don't know, it's like bourbon but more live music, less obnoxious drunk a-holes, and more local hangs there and more locals hang out there. Anyway, after leaving one of his gigs together, we started to walk back to his car, which was parked probably six blocks away. As we're walking and talking about nothing in particular, we notice an older Caucasian gentleman behind us. He wasn't dressed weird or strange. If anything, he had on a really nice suit and jacket. The first thing I noticed was that that He had a really nice voice and a very, I don't know the right way to explain it, but intriguing presence about him. He walked up to my side and said, good evening. We replied the same. He asked if we were locals and we confirmed his suspicion. As he's speaking, I look into his eyes and realize they're gold. Not like hazel or golden brown, straight up gold and almost shimmering and glowing. We continue on our way, chatting about the weather, city, and part ways about three blocks up, as we have a few blocks left to go. I happened to look at a license plate on a parked car. 
it said 666 in the numbers, and I didn't think too much about it. The next car we passed, license plate said saved. Okay, weird considering the last car, but okay. I still don't mention it to my ex. Then finally, we make our car and I swear, and being completely honest here, it said 666 in the numbers again. So I finally say something to my ex and he cuts me off and says, we passed some weird plates tonight. And that guy was freaking me out. Did you see his eyes? They look like fire burning. I tell him I noticed too and I wondered out loud who the man was and even joked about it being the devil. I kid you not, the same guy comes up the street on the opposite side and we can see the glowing eyes from where we're standing. He sees us and waves and shouts a little across the street saying, Funny, we were all meant to be in the same spot at the same time. His smile was almost too wide. We laugh and wave, get in the car, and I don't think I've ever burned rubber, but I know I did that night. I don't know what he was or who he was, but I've never forgotten his presence, his smile, or those damn glowing eyes. Guess that's just New Orleans for you. A user replied to this story called Operation Forsaken 835 to give a bit more context to this mysterious gentleman. The user said, Sounds like maybe a loi, a voodoo god, which would make a ton of sense given where you were. There's tons of stories like that in the American South, but especially New Orleans, being such a melting pot of the occult in a very old hub of spiritual energy. According to lots of American Afro-Caribbean folklore and many modern-day practitioners of voodoo, the Loa are believed to walk among us disguised as normal people, dishing out blessings and curses based on how you treat them. My dad is Jamaican and very intelligent and down-to-earth, but he 100% believes this. He always goes out of his way to help strangers and give money and respects to homeless people. It's a common decency thing that makes the world a better place, but definitely a superstitious thing as well. The Stranger in the Woods, submitted by user Fuzzy Progress 1330. Over the past couple of months, I've been grappling mentally with the passing of my dog. It was a sudden loss for which I wasn't prepared, and I have been grieving ever since. I used to have four dogs, now three, and they all possessed contrasting personalities. My dog, Apollo, who has since passed away, was a beautiful soul. I mean, truly, he was the best boy one could ever imagine. He had a soft and sweet demeanor that set him apart from the others. He was a border collie. In an attempt to overcome my grief, I've been engaging in more outdoor activities. One afternoon, I made the spontaneous decision to take my dog Luna for a hike. I didn't read anything about the trail, I just needed to experience something new. Looking back, that decision unfolded into something truly beautiful. I allowed my girl Luna to lead the way, and she followed her nose up a flight of stairs that led to a trail called Dolly Loop. I have no idea why she chose it, as it wasn't where I had originally planned to go. Just as before, I hadn't researched this trail and was ill-prepared. I generally considered a moderately challenging route. The trail had me slipping out of my shoes at times, but Luna seemed to be having a fantastic time. About 10 minutes into our walk, I spotted an elderly man walking ahead of us. He was dressed in attire that could be mistaken for clothing from the Southern Church era, something reminiscent of the 1920s or 40s, right down to his shoes. At that moment, I could only see his back, and he appeared to have no trouble navigating the trail. However, he periodically paused, gazing around and appreciating the beauty of the place. I remember how he seemed like a picturesque figure in the woods, and I couldn't resist taking a photo. To see someone who appeared to be in their 60s or 70s climbing this trail and enjoying the dappled light filtering through the canopy was truly beautiful. The sunlight danced off his clothing in a mesmerizing way. 
I can't say how long we had been trailing behind him, but at one point we drew close enough for him to turn around. His face didn't align with the age I presumed. From a distance, his once soft gray hair now sported a salt and pepper, slightly curly texture. He looked to be in his 50s, yet there was a comforting familiarity in his friendly demeanor. He bore almost no wrinkles, yet his hair was beginning to show traces of gray, much like my dear Apollo's face. He wore the tiniest round glasses, which I believed are called Windsor glasses. Everything about him seemed oddly out of place, yet strangely fitting. What struck me most was the complete absence of sweat. He simply wore a serene smile. When he turned to us, he smiled and suggested that I should pass him since he might slow me down. I replied, explaining that my dog Luna was timid around people and wouldn't pass them. She would simply lay down if someone approached. He chuckled and remarked on her timidity. I had no recollection of what I said in response, but I had to lift Luna into my arms as she refused to budge. As I walked past him, he commented, She looks like a really good girl. Tears welled up in my eyes at the moment because she was indeed a good girl, just as Apollo had been. Both of them were border collies, but Luna always seemed to be following in Apollo's footsteps, always vying for his attention. After that encounter, it felt as though my sorrow and grief had lifted. I went from shedding tears every day for a month to feeling a sense of peace regarding Apollo's loss. I still think of him daily, but my tears are no longer those of grief. They are tears of gratitude for having had the opportunity to witness his transformation from a curious puppy into a loyal companion. I love each of my dogs as if they were born from my own flesh and blood. This experience felt like a message, a hello or goodbye from Apollo. I will always cherish my boy Apollo, and I hold on to the hope that there may be a chance to see him again someday. When I reached out to this user, he followed up with a bit more information. He mentioned, I omitted a detail in my post. Initially, when I spotted the man from a distance, he appeared elderly. However, as I approached him, his features transformed. His face, hair, even his posture altered. The encounter, even months later, still puzzles me. Intriguingly, he uttered a phrase I use daily with my dog, Apollo, who had just passed. It was an extraordinary experience, and I'm grateful for your understanding and kindness. The Chicago Helper, submitted by user Boop Every Snoot. At the time, I didn't realize, but I got up to some trouble with a friend when I was a young girl. We decided we were going to sneak off to Chicago on an Amtrak without telling our parents to hang out with her boyfriend. This was shortly after my grandma had passed away. The day we were supposed to go, everything in the universe was telling us not to do it. My car broke down on the way to get her. Then her brakes went out, so we got her brother to drive us. Then the damn train broke down. It was an Amtrak Greyhound station, so they offered us discounted bus tickets to Chicago. We didn't know that in Chicago, the bus train station wasn't at the same location as it was in our city. And this was before the super easy cell phone days. On the train, we were visiting with the adults who were like, you what? And did what? And your parents don't know what? We thought it was so funny until we arrived in Chicago and didn't know where the heck we were. Her boyfriend would be at the train station and we had no idea how to get there. We kind of started wandering. It started getting dark. We ended up in a more rough area and we began getting pretty uncomfortable. Out of nowhere, a tiny old lady abruptly asked, you girls lost? You shouldn't be here. Come with me. She started walking along, chatting with us in a pretty, soft-spoken, friendly tone. She said she'd been a school teacher and was involved with horses. She asked what we were doing and where we're from, noting our luggage. We told her, and she reiterated we shouldn't be there without telling her parents, and said she knew of the hometown we were from. It was almost the state capital. I said, yep, only lost by one boat. And she said, no, dear. 
They won by one vote. Here, you're where you need to be now. We turned to thank her, and God is my witness, she was gone. What I realized at that moment, we never told her we were going to the train station. Nobody had bothered us or even looked at us the whole walk. My grandmother, who I was very close to, was a school teacher, and my family owned a horse race track in my state. My grandma worked there sometimes, and my grandpa was a stunt rider. Also, most importantly, when they retired and moved to the small town we all ended up relocating to, when it had almost become the capital, my grandma always, always said it had won by one vote instead of lost. Because if they'd become the capital, it wouldn't have been the quiet, charming little town it was. It was more like Mayberry versus the city that ended up becoming the capital. I'm pretty darn skeptical when it comes to paranormal stuff. I'm not quick to believe, but I'm not an F around and find out person either. In this case, way too many things personally happened for me to believe that was anything but some sort of protection from my grandmother. I don't really remember what the little old lady looked like, but even my friend who knew my grandma was just as confused as I was. We called our parents, confessed our wrongs, and went home. Grocery store visit. Submitted by user Aliens Wear. I live in a small town, population of around 7,000. I'm not from here and don't know everyone, but I've lived here long enough to know at least one person anywhere I go in town. Being a small town, everything closes early. It's winter. I go into the grocery store shortly before closing to grab a few quick things before going home after a late day at work. It's around 8 and it's completely dark. Nothing weird about this at all, but the point is, it was my last opportunity that day to get what I needed from the store. I walk in and I'm wearing some slightly distressed jeans. Nothing too crazy, but the type of distressing that old people like to comment on. Of course, some old rancher dude decides to comment as I'm quickly trying to get my stuff before clothes. He suggests I buy some chaps. I hadn't heard this one before, and frankly, he was hard to understand. It took me a second to get that it was referring to covering up any ripping in my pants. I just kind of chuckled it off and got back to shopping. But I really struggled to understand what this guy was saying. It wasn't an accent. It wasn't a croaky, quiet voice. It wasn't a drunken slur. It was like his mouth struggled to make the shapes the words needed. Even still... I didn't think much of it in the moment because I don't know anyone's medical background. Anyway, I make my way up front to check out the store's closing in 10 minutes. Everyone's at the front of the store. There's only two lanes open, side by side, and about four people checking out in each lane. There's two baggers and then one other employee cleaning at the front of the store. I'm at the front of the line and the cashier was the only guy I knew through my job. Now, I do hair, and I meet a variety of people. I had done the cashier's hair a couple of years at this point. The dude was weird. Anytime I'd run into him in the store before, he'd approach me, say hi, ask how work has been, and then nothing. He'd sit there with a weird grin on his face like he was satisfied with his conversation skills and finished with the conversation, but not finished with the interaction. Even talking to him at my job was always odd. I'm also friends with him on social media, and the way he talks online is entirely different than how he is in person. And I'm not talking about the typical stuff people do where they stretch the truth to bigger themselves or how they complain about every little thing even though they live an average life. No, this guy was eloquent and well-spoken online. But overall, I chalked it up to extreme social anxiety and the internet being an easier way to express himself. He was never mean or malicious. He never gave me bad vibes. He was just a weird dude who seemed to lack a lot of self-awareness. This is getting long, but I promise I'm getting there. So I'm checking out, making the typical weird small talk with my weird cashier pal. When I hear this disjointed sound coming from behind me, 
making noises resembling chaps in church. I turn and see the old dude standing behind me. I look at the cashier, and for once, we're on the same page. I take a minute and ask the old dude to repeat himself. He makes some more noises, but this time I'm able to decode them. He's recommending me a chap store next to a local church. So I take this as an opportunity to give him my same lame joke I give every old person who comments on my ripped jeans. They're my church jeans. Then they give me a confused look, and I reply, because they're holy. My delivery is dry and tired because I just wanted to get out of the employee's hair and get home after a long day. It really isn't a good joke. (laughs) The whole store erupts into laughter. I didn't realize anyone other than the cashier was listening. He and I exchange a look, and again, my weird pal here seems to be the only one acting normal. It's not like the store was packed, but it was creepy. Just hysterical laughter from everyone around us. We're both trying to hurry me through the payment process at this point and keep our heads low. And just as the laughter is dying down, someone in the next lane over says something and it starts all over again. I don't even remember what was said at all. At this point, me and this guy, probably one of the weirdest people I know, are the only ones that seem to be grounded to reality. I can tell by the look in his eyes that he's trying to get me out of there as fast as he can. They're all still laughing and the old man is still trying to talk to me through laughter in a voice that just doesn't quite work. I finally get out of there. I'm the first one done. I look back at the cashier and he seems to be telling me with his eyes to get out of there ASAP. That something is really wrong. I can still hear the laughter behind two sets of sliding glass doors and into the parking lot. I scramble into my truck and lock my doors immediately. I call my husband right away to tell him about it and he agrees with me that it's incredibly strange. At this point I was worried I was the crazy one. I felt like it was a laugh track or that I was on the Truman Show or something. Everything about it seemed false. While on the phone, I realized I'd forgotten an item I had meant to grab and said so to my husband. He told me, in no uncertain terms, not to go back in. It's one of the weirdest things I've ever experienced. The Garage Sale, submitted by user WolfWalker9. When I was a kid, one of my mother's favorite things to do every couple of summers was clean up the house and have a giant garage sale. One year, my mom, sister, and I were all sitting outside. I was about 12 or 13, and my sister was about 7 or 8. And this man comes up and starts looking at stuff on the tables. Something about his energy just set my teeth on edge, and he just felt off. My little sister suddenly tenses up out of nowhere and looks extremely uncomfortable, and my mom was radiating what felt like sheer panic. All three of us felt he was just off or evil or something. He started asking to buy stuff for less, and my mom instantly agrees with his prices, which is totally out of character for her. He gets some really great deals, and I'm feeling pretty indignant about his audacity, but I realize my mom is just trying to get him gone faster. He's just oozing some weird evil energy, although on the surface he seems polite enough. He paid for his stuff and left, and the three of us looked at each other and just breathed a collective sigh of relief. We'd all felt exactly the same thing and confirmed that none of the others were crazy. The Guardian Angel, submitted by Electrical Bit 2969. This happened 25 years ago in Canada. I was a 20 year old girl and in some real trouble. My friends had taken off with the car, I had warrants out for my arrest, and I knew no one, not a single soul. I had $5 to my name, a change of clothes, some makeup, and a single cigarette left in the pack. 
I wandered into a dive joint on the edge of Nanaimo and seated myself on a stool at the bar, wondering how I would get myself out of this pickle and back home to the United States. I spent my last five bucks on a beer and smoked my last cigarette, saying nothing to no one about my troubles. It's difficult to explain how impossible it was for anyone to recognize that I was in dire straits from my appearance. I'm a middle-aged woman now with gray hair and an ass shaped like Texas, which I happily embrace. But at 20, I was considered a looker. And I was very polished, designer clothes, impeccable makeup at all times. No one could possibly know how hungry, alone, and scared I was on the inside. There was a man seated at the table behind me, a blonde man with an accent of some indeterminable origin. I thought maybe it was French-Canadian, but sometimes it sounded Russian or German. He was loudly making jokes that only he found funny, but he looked to the people at the tables beside him and wink every time he said something. I assumed he was drunk and stared straight ahead, ignoring the noise. I don't know why, but after maybe 15 minutes of the loud, ongoing jokes, I got the feeling he was trying to get my attention. Not because I was pretty or he wanted to know me better, but because he wanted me to turn around and look at him. I could just feel it. Feel him watching me, laughing the whole time. Then he began to say things in this very casual, off-handed way that were clearly about me. He asked the man at the table beside him, where do you think she's from? I looked over then and saw the man beside him admit he had no idea. He seemed as though he wanted nothing to do with whatever was brewing. The drunk blonde man said, I think she's from, and named my home state. Then he said, she's lost a long way from home and needs to find her way back. He said to me, are you ready to go home now? And then he laughed until his face was red. Now, I was a little weirded out, but I thought, good guess, stranger things have happened. I didn't say anything in response, but it was obvious I was annoyed. So I turned back to the bar and finished my beer, doing my best to ignore him while he continued to bait me with oddly specific personal comments. A bit later, the waitress walked up to me, set a pack of Dunhills and a very specific amount of money on the bar counter in front of me. Baffled, I asked, who are these from? She said the customer wished to remain anonymous. The drunk blonde loudly and jovially exclaimed, maybe they're from God. I turned around then and snorted. However much his previous comments spooked me, I now knew he was an idiot. I don't think God would want me to have cigarettes. The laughter stopped. He stood up, walked over to me, wearing a stern and darkly serious expression. How would you know what God wants for you? I don't have any words for the way he looked through me or how small it made me feel. I had become the idiot. The bartender and waitress had stopped to listen and the three of us watched him leave. The waitress said, that was him. He gave you the money and cigarettes. He asked me not to say anything, but that was so weird. Then I explained the reality of my situation, but I had just smoked my last cigarette and spent my last five dollars. I walked in not even knowing how I would eat dinner that night. I still thought he was some drunk, but the bartender told me he didn't order anything except soda and entered the bar just moments before I showed up. We were shook by the eeriness of the situation, but especially by him, his presence, the largeness of his personality and his intensity. So you think the story ends there, but it doesn't. That money was precisely enough to buy dinner, a ferry ticket, then a bus ticket back to Whitehorse, where my mother was waiting for me to take me to her home in Alaska. On the ferry, I met another man an old surly man who swore a lot and was heading to Whitehorse too. He noticed I didn't eat anything on the long trip, so he shared the snacks he packed and chased off weird dudes who made inappropriate remarks. When the bus stopped for a refuel and the passengers grabbed a bite at the diner, he brought me a burger and explained he was a Catholic priest 
recovering alcoholic, and an addiction counselor. He showed me his ID and everything. A little over a month earlier, I had a cardiac arrest from an overdose. I was running away because I was afraid if I didn't, I would relapse and wouldn't survive the next time. Every month he traveled for work to an addiction clinic, and his guidance provided the strength I needed to go back to the United States and enter a rehab facility for two months. On a side note, I took care of my Canadian legal troubles and settled down with a Canadian that I coincidentally met when I made it to my home state a year later. We share an adult son together and visit Canada when possible. Everything comes full circle. Life is weird. I've shared this story before, but wound up deleting it. I think of it often, even after all these years. I think of the stranger. Somehow, it feels so intensely personal still. And that's all for this episode. These stories really creep me out. So what was your favorite? I'd love to hear from you. And you can find me a few different ways. At the Chillers and Thrillers YouTube channel. The Chillers and Thrillers Instagram page. And via email at chillersandthrillers at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can leave me a rating and review on your preferred podcast subscriber. Follow me on YouTube. Or you can buy me a coffee. The link is in the show notes. Until next time, I hope all you ghouls and ghosts stay safe. And I'll see you then.